All right, so Matt, I, I started a new job the other day, and I'm actually already tired of it. I mean, all I do is crush soda cans all day. It's soda pressing. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I see that one? I mean, I was like, I'm fixing to, I'm fixing to answer you because I thought I, I need to answer to get the punchline. And he's like, <laughs> Like, didn't, didn't see it coming. That's good. <laughs> good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is is Graveyard Tales. <laughs> All right, everybody. Here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Man, I'm doing good. Good. I'm, I'm doing good. Good. We finally got some uh, some cool weather here in Texas. So it, it was a little cloudy overcast this morning, but dude, great weather. I love this time yeah. of year. Fall is my favorite season. I love it. Yep. Leaves are changing, you know, just mm -hmm. had some, had some spooky time. So, yep. And start wearing uh, a hoodie, a light hoodie. I love it. I love it. So real quick, we want to tell everybody, go check out the Podbelly Network at podbelly.com. We are proud members of the Podbelly Network. Glad to be associated with the, the podcast and the people there. So you can go to podbelly.com and find you some shows that you may not run across otherwise. So go over there and check them out. Um, we also want to thank tonight's sponsors, HelloFresh and a new one, StoryWorth. And we'll talk about them shortly. So if you have a story for our Christmas episode that you are wanting to send in, you need to get that sent to us by December 4th. It's a Saturday. That gives us time to get them all together and and get them set up and read through them and record the episode. So December 4th, if you haven't sent in your story, then do it by then. And Matt, if, if this is their first episode of Graveyard Tales, first of all, hello. Thanks for joining us. Um, but tell them what we do, man. Well, every Christmas, uh, Adam and I like to... Um bring back that that old victorian tradition of reading ghost stories by the christmas eve fire right and you know it was it was a really big tradition you know it was a time of year where people thought about loved ones who had passed you know maybe maybe uh, this was the first christmas without one um I mean, it's in that song, man. Scary yeah. ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmas that, is long, long ago. That's it. That's it. And so, you know, that was a common thing to sit down, share ghost stories around the Christmas Eve fire. So that's what we're going to do. Right. So send send in your stories, um, you know, personal experiences, weird things that happened, you know, some old ghost story that your grandfather told you. Um, anything like that, we, we want to, we want to see it. We want to read it and we're going to read them on the show. Um, and, and you guys, you, you've been made this show bigger and better every year. Oh yeah. And we expect that this year is going to be the same. Yep. So we tell you our scary stories all the time. So it's time for you to tell us yours. So we tell you ours, you tell us yours or something. However that saying goes, something like that. <laughs> Um, while you're on the internet sending us those stories, go give us a rate and review on iTunes. That really helps us out. It brings us up the charts. For some reason, their algorithm um, is set to where if you get a certain number of five-star reviews and people saying something on those reviews, then it bumps you up and they suggest you to other people. So Matt and I are always wanting to grow the graveyard. So do us a solid and go over there and rate and review us. That way more people can find us. They can, you know, maybe get randomly suggested here, go listen to these two idiots. And then they listen and they enjoy it. So do that. And give us a rate and review. 
Okay, guys, if you've listened to the show in the last few years, you know that that Adam and I enjoy playing Best Fiend. Oh, yeah. And it's it's one of those great um, match puzzle games, but with a, a twist. It's not the typical game, and it, it all the other ones are just variations of the same thing, but Best Fiends takes it to another level. So you can stop crushing the same old candy and try a puzzle game with something fresh. Now, with Best Fiends, you're going to play through a real storyline with good guys, which are the fiends, and the not-so-good guys, the slugs. And your fiends will start out as little baby versions of themselves, and the more you play, the more fiends are on your team, and the more powerful they become, which helps you solve increasingly difficult puzzles as you progress through the game. That's right. And, you know, it's an action-packed adventure and brain-boosting puzzle game kind of all rolled into one. And I think that's why our ladies are a lot better at it than we are. Um, Our brains are not as boosted as they should be uh, or as boosted as our wives are because they are killing it. And Matt and I, we love playing it, but we're definitely not as skilled as Ashley and Amanda are. They can they can rock it out, and I find myself a lot of times going, um, Ashley, can can you help me kill these slugs, please? <laughs> I, I need help killing slugs. And she does, and she helps me move right along. Uh, but they add new content all the time. So my ADD butt is never bored because it's always something new, different things for the season. They're adding new puzzles, so I'll never run out. I will never have to stop asking Ashley to help me is basically what I'm saying. Um, So if you want to get in on that, then you need to download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Remember, that's friends without the R. It's Best Fiends. That's right. You can download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, best fiends. Matt, that's really all the housekeeping I got kind of short and sweet this time. So why don't you tell us, what are we talking about tonight, brother? Okay, so tonight, Adam and I are going to look into a a strange, odd weird how whatever you want to call it whatever adjective you want to put on it mysterious yes mysterious uh chain of events that have occurred along the 37th parallel now when you when you think about it, you're like what well, 37th parallel what is that well we're going to get into that but it's a it's a very odd that so many strange paranormal extraterrestrial experiences have occurred right along this line that cuts across you know the entire globe but right. predominantly these events happen in the United States right um everything from ufo sightings to cattle mutilations to just weird things mhm and there you 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 plot them out on a map, and they happen right along this band that goes across the country. Um, we're going to talk about that, and maybe uh, maybe what's causing that. We're going to look into some very specific things that have happened um, a- along the thirty seventh parallel. So this is this is going to be interesting. If you're not familiar with stories about this, you're going to enjoy this. Yep, and uh, it's. You don't hear it talked about much on podcast. I think I've heard a couple um, podcasts do stuff on the 37th parallel, but um, a lot of the stories that we have talked about coincidentally have happened along this area. So we thought it fitting to do something to, you know, kind of bring it all together. So as we always say, go check our sources down at the bottom of the show notes. You can find where we found our information. You can follow along. 
Um, you can find more out about the people who did this research that um, we have collated and all that. So go over there, check our sources, bottom of the show notes. We first need to look at what the 37th parallel north is. And then it's specific, the 37th north, because there is a 37th parallel south, and it doesn't have the same deal. Yeah, we didn't go south. Right. We, we, we stayed north. We stayed north we? of the equator. <laughs> so the 37th parallel north is a circle of latitude that is 37 degrees north of the Earth's equatorial plane. It crosses Europe, the Mediterranean Sea, Africa, Asia, the Pacific Ocean, North America, and the Atlantic Ocean. And that what we're going to be talking about, the 37th parallel is the center of this band that we're going to be talking about. And it may drop a few degrees south or a few degrees north of it. Sometimes things will be like the 30. 35th parallel north or the 39th parallel north but it's all within a it's like putting a belt around the 37th parallel you're going to have a little bit on either side of it so at this latitude the sun is visible for 14 hours and 42 minutes during the summer solstice and 9 hours and 37 minutes during the winter solstice now a lot of this next little bit is going to come from Ben Mesrick's research. Now he says along this desolate, largely uninhabited stretch of land, mysterious things happen with eerie frequency, strange flying objects, thousands of mutilated cows and horses drained of blood and missing surgically removed reproductive organs, tongues, and ears. And we've talked about cattle mutilations Mm -hmm. and we'll, uh, we'll touch on that a little bit more in the episode here in a minute, but he says, unexplained lights darting in the sky, alleged underground military installations. Yeah. Which is, that's kind of cool. And and there's some that I've got on our list for us to talk about, Matt. That, uh, <laughs> they're, they're on our topic list because I, I like these supposed military installations. Now, the location of so many UFO sightings and cattle mutilations has also apparently been the latitude of choice for government bases and American Indian holy sites, Mesrick claims. Now, the 37th parallel has also been called the UFO highway and the paranormal highway because of these incidents. Yep. This next bit comes from Gaia. Um, If you don't know about the Gaia research and the Gaia website, um, go over and check them out, Gaia.com. They are... A pl- uh, they got a plethora of different yeah. things in there to um, that kind of go along with what we talk about. Yeah, yeah, and it's and, and it's quality research. Yes, and you know it it's it's no it's no bull. It's just this this is this is the straight dope. Yep, and they have a lot of scientific studies and stuff in there mm-hmm. too, depending on what what you're researching. So. Um, Check them out. Um, But they say that a few odd facts about the 37th parallel. Americans living north of the 37th parallel are twice as likely to develop multiple sclerosis than those who live south of it. That's that's nuts to me. Yeah, it's weird. The fact that they they were uh, anyone was able to to gather that much data and show a correlation, even if it's a small one. Right, right. Um, They say this may have to do with lower amounts of sunlight north of this line, um, as MS seems to be related to a lack of vitamin D. Um, And I heard that years ago. I went through a lot of tests to see if I had MS. And one of the things that pointed toward maybe I do is I was uh, vitamin D deficient at the time. So I have taken more vitamin D to... Uh, uh, negate that but uh, it's just it's really weird that like you said they would find that correlation of people having MS more frequently above the 37th parallel Uh, they say there are economic impacts as well in 2010 homes below the 37th parallel were more likely to be upside down on mortgages (laughs) again what an oddball 
thing to to even mm-hmm. consider. Yep. To to look into. Right, and that's that thing though. You wonder it, it, the correlation causation thing. Hmm. Um. Correlation doesn't always mean causation and vice versa, but mm-hmm. apparently that's a, a common thing. So I don't know. Now, some of the landmarks, the important landmarks along the 37th parallel we need to look at because you'll notice that we have touched on some of these. Uh, we will probably touch on uh, quite a few more of these in the future mm-hmm. in our episodes. And you may have heard these from other shows, other TV shows, stuff like that. But these landmarks include the Pentagon, Fort Knox, and Washington, D.C. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, Kentucky's Mammoth Cave National Park. Mm-hmm. The notorious New Mexico Dulce Base. That's one that's on our episode mm-hmm. topics list. Dulce, yep. New Mexico. Um, Los Alamos, New Mexico. Colorado's Mesa Verde. Um, four corners where Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico meet. And you'll remember we talked about four corners mm-hmm. in a couple episodes, um, especially when we talked about um, the Wendigo. Um, Aztec, New Mexico, where the 1948 UFO crash was. Death Valley, which is Nevada's Area 51. The Grand Canyon. Utah's Moab and Canyonlands National Park. And outside the U.S., the 37th parallel north passes through Grenada, Spain, which has documented UFO sightings in 1976. Fukushima, Japan, site of the 2011 earthquake and nuclear disaster, and the border between North and South Korea. So those are some pretty big landmarks to be on one parallel. Yeah. It, and it's and it's odd because we're we're not looking at well so for example when we talked about all of those uh, the ancient sites that fall along the uh, the the line that you can circumvent the the earth with right like Easter Island Machu Picchu mm-hmm. you know the Great Pyramids. Um, you know, they're, they all have at least that in common. It's an ancient uh, site, but these are very unique because we have, we have natural geography. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got man-made structures and we've got um, UFO you know, crashes, go- UFO crashes. We've got government, uh, you know, major government. Uh, locations Mm -hmm. so it's such a wide array of things that you could you could easily say well they all just happen to be on this and you know that may very well be the case but when you start looking at the events that occur it really starts to make make you think maybe there's more to this than just coincidence yep exactly now we need to look at some history of these mysteries that happen on the 37th parallel. So history, mysteries, mystery, history, mysteries, history. I don't know. There's, (laughs) there's a TV show that has a name similar to that. And if, if we start one, we need to do like, um, missed. I don't know. I'll figure it out. I'll tell you later. Um, uh, Mysteries of history and <laughs> yeah, H- historical history mysteries, something redundant <laughs> like that. And the dictionary under redundant is this C redundant? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the redundant department of redundancy department. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, anomalies along the 37th parallel have been reported since the 19th century and earlier if you include reports from indigenous people. Now, the Jops, the Joplin spook light, also called the Tri-State spook light, and the Ozark spook light was first noted in 1836. It was seen by native people on the Trail of Tears in Missouri and Oklahoma. Oh, my God. It just hit me when you were reading the, the Joplin spook light. I thought, also called, and I was like, 
oh, well, maybe they decided that, you know, spook light wasn't the best term. And they're like, like no, we just turned it to the tri-state spook light. Yeah, we just keep doing that 14 <laughs> like, times. You, could, you couldn't come up with something better than spook light? <laughs> yeah, you could do the Joplin crazy light, the tri-state <laughs> floating light, yeah. um, the Ozark creepy light, something. <laughs> <laughs> they just kept it it's like oh my god i remember this joke my mom told me when i was a kid she said about this guy went to uh went to the courthouse to change his name mm-hmm. and the judge said what's your name and he said uh bill lip <laughs> he said wow i i probably would want to change that he said uh what do you want to change it to he said joe lip <laughs> 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 I'm going to use that now. So. <laughs> That's good. Oh, and we digress. Uh, always. <laughs> always. So luminous objects were spotted near the rising sun at Burrett College in Tennessee on June 1st, 1853. Students reported that uh, one looked like a moon and the other looked like a star. The lights did not move for 30 minutes, but expanded and contracted in size several times. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And it's there in Tennessee. So, yeah. Now, residents of Wilmington, Delaware, saw the sky fill with a pale blue light as a large object moved overhead. It was followed by three red and glowing balls in July 1860 according to the Wilmington Tribune. Now, mystery airships were reported in Arkansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Texas, Kansas, and Kentucky in the late 1890s. You know, we're talking about uh, aerial phenomena that at at the time weren't as easily explained. Exactly. And that's that's why I I want to us uh, dive deep into that because... (laughs) That is something that has fascinated me for uh, for a while. The 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 time frame, yeah. Why we're seeing them at that time, yeah. you know, like you said, it can't be explained by oh, that's Joe Schmo's um, uh, uh, drone out there, right. or you know that that's just a, a light aircraft. They didn't yeah. have that, or a weather balloon, yeah, or any of the other common explanations we've gotten since about you know the 1930s yeah okay so this these sightings predate you know those events you know by a good you know anywhere from 50 to 70 years yep when when things flying above your head just weren't common Mm -hmm. um so yeah it's totally interesting that these kind of descriptors, which we see currently, yeah, you know, we we've got a lot of places that we've talked about that have mysterious lights. Um, they're very similar. Oh you know, yeah, we have similar reports in 2021 that we had in 1860. Yep, exactly. Now, native people all have ancient quote star people stories. Uh, many tribes, including the, um. Dine, D-I-N-E, uh, the Navajo. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I apologize, but the Navajo. I, I think I think they're kind of the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it, the the Dine and the Navajo are are the same. I just don't know how you correctly I, pronounce I that. I don't either. I'm unfamiliar with it. So if you speak Navajo and you can tell me how to pronounce that, please do. Um, I don't like being that ignorant. <laughs> I'm pretty ignorant, but I don't like being that ignorant. <laughs> That's right. There's a line. There's yeah. There's a there's an ignorant line, and I don't like to cross it. Um, the Apache, the Pueblo, the Hopi, and Santa Clara all tell creation stories that include their people being brought to the Earth's surface at locations along the 37th parallel, generally in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, and the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The Tiwa people identify a location near the Great Sand Dunes Monument in Colorado's San Luis Valley as their place of emergence. These sacred sites are called Sipapu. Um, And that 
is another thing that has has fascinated me for a while. A lot of Native American tribes, some of the first people's tribes, they have the stories of ant people or star people. And it depends on where in in the nation you go. Mm -hmm. But some people talk about the star people, their star brothers, sky brothers, bringing the the first Navajo or whatever to that area. And then others talk about the ant people who brought them up from underground. Yep. So it, it's it's fascinating. And it's fascinating that a lot of these sites of the first emergence happened within this 37th parallel band. Yeah, for multiple tribes. Yes. Um, you know, it, it it's one thing for these these different tribes to have a similar creation story. But it's another for different tribes to have you know, these sacred sites or these Sapapu mm-hmm. all along that region of the 37th parallel. Right, right. It, it really makes you wonder. Um, I, I don't, I don't have a good explanation like a debunking explanation for why that would be. Yeah, I, I don't either, but we've had other, other Native American stories um that really show that regardless of tribe there was a connection to the earth yes. and an understanding that i i don't think in the modern times we appreciate that mm-hmm. you know, understanding the land <clears throat> and that there was a there was a give and take relationship there Mm-hmm. Not that there is not, there isn't now. It still works that way. I just don't think you know we consider it as often as we should. Right. Um. But the idea that you know the the land will provide for us, we must provide for the land as well, and that allows you to understand more about you know energies associated with the earth, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, different you know physical traits of of different geography. You know, learning that and appreciating it and then applying it, um, whether it's constructing a sacred site, whether it's knowing where to plant, um, whether it's knowing where the best hunting will be or, you know, being able to to shelter yourself from, you know, weather trends. You know, when you focus on that, you learn more about the right. planet where we live and, and these Native Americans did. And yet, as I said, multiple tribes put these sacred sites along that line. So I I tend to believe that it was that connection, that understanding of the earth and the planet that led them to do this. Yep. You know, but the question is, is what were what were they harnessing there? Right. Right. What did they know? What did they feel or what could they tell? that we don't nowadays because we've lost that connection. I don't know. Um, Now, we've done a whole episode on cattle mutilations, like I said, but we need to take a quick look at some of the ones that happened on the 37th parallel. This says, for decades, ranchers in the 37th zone have been frustrated and confounded by loss of livestock to mutilations. The documented methods, regardless of location, are virtually identical. The removal of genitals and bowels, eyes, and sometimes ears with surgical precision, and complete absence of blood, like we talked about in our episode. Um, To get more detail on that, go back and check out our cattle mutilations episode. I'm not sure what number that is, but just type it in (laughs) into whatever player. Go to our... Uh, feed and then type in cattle mutilations and it'll pop up. Now, Missouri cattle mutilations beginning in 1975 continue to be reported. Arkansas had its share of cattle mutilations and a history of UFOs first reported as the Arkansas airship mystery. Now, the 1894 Kansas UFO cattle mutilation 
is perhaps the earliest recorded event, but mutilation activity ramped up in the 1970s. Now, in Kansas, thousands of cattle turned up dead, enough that there was an FBI investigation in 1975. The mutilations were making mainstream news. The March 2nd, 1975 edition of the New York Times reported that ranchers along the Texas-Oklahoma border believed the relentless mutilations were the work of sat sat Satanist cults. Um, quote, this thing will probably end with the vernal equinox, which is the same day as Easter, end quote, said John Dunn, president of the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association. Unfortunately, the livestock deaths have continued to present day, which we I, I feel like we covered that that case a little more in depth in our episode. Yeah, I think we did. Um, and it is interesting. And, and, you know, if if you were going to if you're going to attribute it to a cult, then I think your your guess was right. You know, it'll yeah. probably end. But, it, you know, as Adam said, it didn't. It did not. Now, further west in New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, Utah and Nevada, mutilations are so common that most go unreported. Researcher Chuck Zukowski, subject uh, of author Ben Mesrick's bestseller, The 37th Parallel, The Secret Truth Behind America's UFO Highway, has documented mutilations from Kansas to Arizona for decades. In fact, it was Zukowski who identified the 37th as a continental zone of heightened anomalous activity. No matter how many cases are reported and documented or who investigates them, the mutilations continue unabated for unknown reasons by unapprehended perpetrators. So, Adam, let's let's take a minute and talk about who Chuck Zukowski is. Is he is uh, he is probably the leading figure along with uh, with Ben Mesrick, right? On the strange events along the thirty seventh parallel, and he's he's just become in the last you know thirty years or more, he is the go to paranormal investigator uh, along the the southern borders of Colorado, Utah, Kansas. And it's where he examines these animal mutilations and UFO sightings, trying to get enough evidence to show not just the correlation, but perhaps evidence of alien activity. Right. Right. Now, it's interesting because in 2011, you know, Zukowski was actually fired from his job uh, as a reserve sheriff's deputy with the El Paso Sheriff's Department as a result. Of And this is a quote, a result of conducting paranormal and unidentified flying object investigations into animal mutilations and refusing to refrain from conducting paranormal and unidentified flying object invest investigations, which could be viewed as a conflict of interest. This was from his termination letter. <laughs> I, I like this guy. I, yeah. I, he's like, screw it. I'm going to keep doing it. That's that's exactly right. That's what he did, and uh, now I think he's um he's like a microchip developer, um something like that. But this is you know that's his that's his paying job, yeah. You know which allows him to continue and and do this research. Okay, so let's talk about one of my favorite things in the world and that's not having to go to the grocery store i yeah i still have to go occasionally but hello fresh has helped me not have to do it as often i had to go today and the whole time i was thinking you know good thing i got hello fresh waiting for me at home so i don't have to pick up all the annoying ingredients that i've got to to make dinner tonight i just open up the box and go but hello fresh is a meal delivery service and with them you get fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep you can skip the grocery store trips for the most part you might need toilet paper they don't send you toilet paper but anyway you gotta um gotta skip most of them and the best way to do it is hello fresh because they will send you fun affordable and easy to make home cooking recipes 
And the holidays can be hectic, but HelloFresh helps keep things simple with recipes and ingredients that cut out grocery shopping and limit meal prep so you can spend more time of the festive season with your friends and family. And HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, including vegetarian, calorie smart, and gourmet options, providing plenty of variety, which is great because Matt, as you know, you get stuck in a rut sometimes when you're making your own meals and you might make the same thing 16 times a month just because you've got nothing else on your mind that you know how to make. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, we'll we'll get into that rut and then I'll have to listen to Brooks go, we're having this again. <laughs> yep. And, and I'm thinking, we haven't had this since. And then I look and it was like, you know, four days ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, but HelloFresh changes all that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's something new. It's something different. It's something maybe that you've never tried before, or there's a unique twist that takes this one simple dish and puts it on a whole nother level. And it's so great because we have fun when uh, the kids can help cook and you get the easy to follow recipe cards. Brooks and Piper are in there. I don't have to worry about a measuring ingredients because they're already measured. And I don't have to worry about grabbing some weird ingredient because I already have it. Right. And you've never seen frustration like me in the produce section hunting for a jicama. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I just, I, at, at one point, you know, I might as well just have a sign on that says, help me, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> Can't stand it. But if with HelloFresh, if you've got a jicama that needs to be used in your recipe, you're going to get one. And it just makes it so much easier. And and it's delicious. Right. And, and one good thing, Matt, is they talk about, you know, the different seasonal meals that you can get. And it's true because they kind of change for the season and... You, you want something different during the fall, so they send you recipes like chicken ramen in the shoyu-style broth. And so, I mean, soups are great for fall and winter. And Yeah, we love it. We love soup. Oh, yeah, and everybody loves pumpkin during mm. the, the fall and all that. And their marketplace features a variety of add-ons for breakfast, desserts, and seasonal snacks. One of them is Pillsbury pumpkin cookie dough. So you can get some pumpkin cookies out of HelloFresh if you if you want to. And one year, uh, it's probably been about three years ago, um, I actually had Thanksgiving dinner provided by HelloFresh, thanks to my sister. It's great, and right? It was, it, it was fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. do that. If you don't want to spend all this time trying to figure out what you're going to make for Thanksgiving or even for Christmas... Get HelloFresh. It'll help you out. All right. So Graveyard Tales listeners, you can go to HelloFresh.com slash Graveyard14. That's G-R-A-V-E-Y-A-R-D-1-4. And use the code Graveyard14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. That's right. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Graveyard14 G-R-A-V-E-Y-A-R-D-1-4 and use our code Graveyard14 and you can get up to 14 free meals and three free gifts because it's America's number one meal kit. And you can... um you can watch uh, Chuck and his son Daniel uh, on their investigations on the 37th parallel on Travel Channel's Alien Highway, which, I, if I'm not mistaken, came out in 2019. I think it it only ran for one season, but you can still catch it. Um, and it's 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 really fascinating, you know, the things that they look into and that mm-hmm. they consider to be um, a, a part of this weird anomaly. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty interesting. But but Chuck is a very polarizing figure. Oh yeah. Um, you know, he's 
he he's very unique, but he's also, as Adam and I were talking about before the show, he's extremely passionate about this. Yes, he is. Um, and, you know, he really, he really puts forth, uh, you know, the effort to, to make these correlations. And even Ben Mesrick said, you know, he was a skeptic before he met Chuck. Uh-huh. And when he was researching for, uh, for the book, you know, Chuck convinced him, Hey, we, we need to be paying attention to this. Right. Right. So we need to look at, um, a few other like weird things, um, different weird areas, uh, weird happenings along the 37th here. Um, and we'll just briefly touch on some of these. Um, but things get stranger, this says, along the 37th between Colorado and New Mexico, and the weirdness doesn't abate until the line crosses into California. Now, the northern New Mexico and southern Colorado landscape between the 36th and the 38th parallels is weird enough, ranging from lunar landscapes, so desolate like the moon, um, to pristine alpine zones, river valleys, and canyons, Sparsely inhabited for decades, the major industry has been oil and gas. Vast reservation land stretch across the New Mexico-Colorado state line at Four Corners. So they say a lot of that area, you know, is desolate and largely uninhabited. Which makes a lot of these stories to come out of there even more intriguing. That you know, they had to be big events if a sparsely populated area knew about it, witnessed it, and was able to pass it on. Now, and this is northern New Mexico that we'll talk about, and New Mexico is a place of contradictions. This says, as one of the poorest states in the U.S., it's also home to the highest concentration of PhDs in the country and the Los Alamos Research Laboratories. So because of Los Alamos, they've got a ton of PhDs there. Yeah. Now it says spending time in New Mexico can give a visitor the sense that they have left the continental United States or in, and are in another country altogether. Um, but it's inhabited by native Americans and the descendant descendants of a 17th century Spanish colonists in the land of enchantment. Quirkiness is noted as a fact of life. The overwhelming number of stories, rumors, and facts regarding UFOs, aliens, underground bases, Dulce, vortexes, uh, portals, Sasquatch sightings, chupacabra sightings, living dinosaur birds, the terratorns that we've discussed, and high-speed underground transit tunnels are commonplace. Then there are ghost stories of spirits of Spanish folklore. So. It's got everything just in this one little area along the 37th parallel. They've got everything and they've talked about it for years. One of the ghosts um, of Spanish folklore we have touched on, but it's La Llorona. Um, La Llorona is a story of a woman who drowned her children and now as a spirit wanders the Rio Grande River territory, crying and dragging children to their death in the river. She is the official state boogeyman for the children of New Mexico. Her legend is alive and well, and she represents the old Spanish culture of the region. Conquistadors arrived in the 16th century. Santa Fe, the oldest state capital in the U.S., was established in 1610. Indigenous people, the ancestors of the Hopi, Navajo, Comanche, Ute, and Zuni tribes have lived in the region since 10,000 B.C.E which is amazing. Yeah, it it really is. I mean, they don't call it the land of enchantment for nothing. I mean, it's, it's a pretty magical place. And I've, I've not been, but I've had, uh, I've had friends from there and, uh, I, I work with, uh, someone from New Mexico right now. And it's, it's just an, it's different. It's unlike any of the other states. Right. You know, not right. just in, in geography, but just in culture. Yeah. Yep. And one of the things in New Mexico is Dulce. Um, and we need to briefly touch on it, but 
Dulce, the Dulce base is one that is on our list that Matt and I are going to do because of how much weirdness revolves around that. So that, that may be coming up before too long. Now this is while the entire state is a paranormal playground, a standout located on the 37th parallel at the Colorado, New Mexico state line is the notorious Dulce underground base on the Jicaria Apache lands or Hikaria, probably Hikaria, um, Apache lands subject of books, articles, and widespread speculation. Dulce was brought to public awareness by Paul Benowitz, an Albuquerque businessman and UFO researcher. Insiders reached out to Benowitz. He heard stories of off-world species living in the underground base and descriptions of bizarre genetic hybrid research. He naively reported his findings and suspicions to the government, but misplaced his trust. Benowitz eventually had a nervous breakdown, quote unquote, under suspicious circumstances. He was uh, dismissed as a delusional paranoid dying in 2003, but rumors and discussions of a secret military base housing aliens at Dulce persist. Software engineer Anthony Sanchez began researching UFOs at Area 51 in 1989 and wrote the, quote, Bible on Dulce, which is, quote, UFO Highway. Yeah. So it, it's, man, Dulce, when we do the Dulce episode, it will be a long episode. Yeah. Because there is so much going on there. And the underground, like, one of the things that, they have talked about is the underground off-world species. Yeah. So they say that's where they keep aliens from off-world in this underground base, and they actually run part of it. Like the aliens run part of that underground base, and humans run the other part of it. It's like Men in Black. Yeah, you know, <laughs> they yeah. walk in and and. All all the different aliens are, uh, you know, running the show, monitoring yep. the radar, and all that. Basically, stuff. yeah, basically. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it is. It's really interesting how much actually goes on along this band, um, and and we're going to continue to talk about some of these weird um, uh, anomalies that that occur. And one of these is something that Adam and I have discussed on an episode. The the Taos hum. Mm -hmm. So if you recall from that episode, it, it, a strange humming noises, a strange humming noises, uh, have plagued the town of Taos since the early 1990s. Now it's one of those weird things that not everybody experiences. Right. But right. But there's enough people that experience it. That you can't just say, hey, it's just a, a bunch of people that have tinnitus or something. I mm -hmm. mean, I've, I've only met a handful of people that have tinnitus. You know? I yeah. mean, really? Yeah. And, uh, constant tinnitus. Yeah. People get ringing in their ears, but. Oh, sure. Only a few people have it where it's constant. Where, you know, where it's actually a medical condition. Yeah. Um. But there's so many in this area that just that can just hear it. I even say you can feel it. You know, it, 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 it just something it does to your body. Um, but Zakowski is among the believers that the hum comes from the construction of an underground human and alien base, which is what yeah. we're talking about with uh, with Dulce. Uh, residents they they find the noise annoying. Some report that it causes dizziness, insomnia, sleep disturbances, and headaches. And researchers have determined that about 2% of the population in Taos were what they call hearers. But there's been no evidence to prove that the humming really exists, okay, other than the reports of the people that can hear it. Now, Zukowski went there in 96 but he said he and his family couldn't, they, they couldn't hear it. Yeah. Okay. But they yeah. talked to plenty of people that could. They're going, and dude, it's happening right now. You can't hear <laughs> that. Right. Can it's driving not? me nuts. Yeah. Now 
uh, along with this, there there has been just tons of UFO sightings. So I'm going to touch on several of these. Um, and, and it's amazing how how they occur right along this area. Um, but this one, uh, this one came, this was an anonymous report from Wichita. And, and this person claimed to have seen a UFO, quote, radiating its own light on May 29th of 2011. Now, the report says that this person said, I saw a light in the sky. The only way I can describe it is that the light was different from a star. Now, this is what was reported to the National UFO Reporting Center. He said he spotted the peculiar light around 2 a.m. while he was outside smoking a cigarette a few miles from McConnell Air Force Base. And he says, I studied it for about 10 minutes noticed it was oscillating slightly and making very small, rapid movements. So again, you know, a mysterious light, potential UFO. Making um, weird movements. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, something that we've, we've talked about on this show many, many times. Mm-hmm. Now, the next one goes into Piedmont, Missouri, which has its own it's it's own thing you know we could we could talk about piedmont for a show but since february of 1973 hundreds of piedmont residents have reported seeing flying objects and mysterious lights in the sky a local high school basketball team supposedly witnessed a bright shaft of light beaming down from the atmosphere and noticed an object hovering in the distance hmm it's the it's the uh, the tracker beam that you know yeah right pulls up the cattle <laughs> yeah right, man that just reminded me there's um pictures that just came out of skinwalker ranch have you oh, seen yeah, these yeah where there is a blue beam going from sky to ground coming out of the skinwalker ranch area i saw them amanda said they were filming a movie out there they've got a documentary going on um yeah, yeah. i knew that, about that and, and that may uh, be related. Yeah. But they, yeah, it, it looks cool. Something. Yeah. It's weird looking. But, you know, as the sightings continued in Piedmont, the red, the length, the residents started to gather at a nearby landfill to watch the lights together. Now, this is according to Zakowski. Why they chose landfill, I don't know. I, you know, pick somewhere that smells a little bit better. I was going to say, I, I'm smell sensitive. I would have picked hey, a different spot. Come on over here. Put, yeah, put your lawn chair right there. Just yeah. pick all those empty cans and bottles out of your way. Just just bring a, a blanket. I mean, all the trash underneath you will cushion it. And <laughs> Yeah. Lord. But Zakowski said he's visited this area numerous times. And he's talked to the locals about what they've seen. Now, the most recent time he was there, he said he talked to two women who actually saw the craft associated with the lights. Hmm. Now, this one, I really... Now, I have come across this story before. Um, this happened in 1941 in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. A Baptist minister was called to an apparent plane crash to perform last rites for the deceased. But when he got to the crash scene, the minister supposedly didn't see any humans. Instead, he saw a disc-shaped object surrounded by tiny gray people. I've heard about this, yeah. Now, now, after the minister prayed for them, he was escorted away by the FBI. Zukowski believes that this minister discovered a crash site, which is now a gravel pit. Huh. So the gravel pit has destroyed any uh, topography evidence of a crash. Right. So, yeah, I, I had come across Not that. Not an accident, I don't yeah. think. Uh-uh. No, it just. You just decided to build a gravel pit right here. This, hey, is, uh, the, this is the best place, huh? Yeah, we uh, let's just put a gravel pit in here, Bill. Yeah. Why put it here? There's a better spot. No, 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 no. We got to put it here. Got to put it here. <laughs> How do you get rid of evidence for uh, for a crash of a UFO? 
dig an enormous hole. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Just rearrange the entire landscape. Yep. Now, a Captain Thomas Mantle was pi- was a pilot for the Kentucky National Guard in 1948 when he received orders to fly after an unusual aerial object. Now, the 25-year-old pilot took off after the crash in a P-51 Mustang fighter plane. Supposedly, as the story goes, he crashed and died as he pursued the UFO. The believers say that Mantell reported by radio that he could see tiny creatures in a mysterious aircraft. The Air Force announced that his death was, as a, re- was a result of oxygen deprivation and that he was chasing after the planet Venus. So, I, I mean, you know, we know that Venus is, is bright in the sky. Um, it's often and mistaken it's used. for a scar, for a scar, and, for a star. <laughs> Lord, and it's used talk. a lot. No, uh, it's used a lot uh, by skeptics for yeah. people who were thinking they were getting a UFO, but it was just Venus. And it's like, well, I don't think Venus is five feet from me. So, but that's fine. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's easy pickings. I mean, you know, you, you've got a pilot in a plane. There's a lot of things that can happen in flight that would disorient a pilot. You know, he's looking up, but he's actually looking down and he can't tell. And if there, you take oxygen deprivation into consideration, you know, then he's very disoriented. I mean, that that's an easy explanation. And, and I'm sure it has been responsible for plenty of crashes. Probably, yeah. Okay. But on this particular one, it, it may not have been. And Zukowski believes that the announcement from the government was an attempt to keep real information from the public. Right. Which, you know, the government doesn't tell us the whole story. I mean, what? I can't believe that. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> now, on December Hey, 10th, did y'all know the government lies to us? <laughs> <laughs> We, we will never lie to you. No. <laughs> we may accidentally tell you something that isn't true because we're stupid, <laughs> that's but true. that's a whole nother. <laughs> that's that that's, ignorant thing. That's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we didn't lie. <laughs> no. We're just stupid. <laughs> now, uh, on December 10th, 2010, a Roanoke resident reported seeing a disc-shaped orb zipping through the clouds. Now, the witness was looking for a shortcut down an old country road that turned out to be a dead end. So as the car went back and retraced its route, the driver saw the mysterious aircraft moving westward at a very fast pace. The object also gave off a light blue aura and moved up and down without sound. Now, this Hmm. is according to the report. Um that was given to the national UFO reporting center. So all of these areas, uh, you know, across the country that, that have the, this weird frequency of these events, you know, they fall like Adam said, you know, within a reasonable distance of the 37th parallel, you know, it's not going to be a perfect line. So we've talked about a lot of these things, that have gone on every everything cattle mutilation you know strange noises potential underground army uh, or military bases um the potential of having an alien human run facility yeah yep i mean and and we we did look and and there is mention of of bigfoot sightings um but not enough that we could we could correlate it for the show, but yeah. you know, there have been plenty of Bigfoot sightings along uh, the 37th parallel. And, you know, a, w- when you look at the slant that Adam and I put on it, the idea that Bigfoot is a, an interdimensional creature, you know, that is able to pass to and from mm-hmm. uh, into our dimension and back to its own. If, if all this crazy stuff is happening along that, parallel why not that too 
You know, yep, exactly. If there's enough energy there that it would attract all these other phenomena, then why not dimensional portals? Yeah. Yep. So we've laid all this out for you. You know, all these different and odd things. What in the world could be going on along the 37th parallel that's causing this to happen or at least in some way facilitating it? Yeah, I mean, the the thing that has popped into my head the, the whole time doing this research is we recently did ley lines. Right. So what if the 37th parallel is like the artery and all the ley lines are the veins? That's, that's, a, that's a new one. I like and it. And so the, the 37th parallel is what's carrying the majority of this energy for the earth. And then the veins, the ley lines are branching out from there. And those who are more in tune to that kind of thing can tell. So UFOs would travel that path more because of the energy. Ancient peoples who knew about the, the energy in that area would build there. The government who has been told about this and, and maybe... You know, they've got aliens telling them because of the Dulce base, they've got aliens telling them, hey, this is a power spot built along here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it's, that's just what kept popping into my head was the 37th parallel is like an artery to the ley line veins. Yeah. And and it very well could be. Um, You know, that's where we we mentioned earlier the energy that fuels all of this. Yep. Um. Adam, let's take a moment and talk about one of our newest sponsors to Graveyard Tales, and that's StoryWorth. Now, this holiday season, I want to give a gift to my family and my loved ones that makes them feel special and unique, just like our relationship. And that's why I'm giving everyone I care about StoryWorth. A StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. It, it's a thoughtful and meaningful gift that connects you to those who matter most. Every week, StoryWorth emails your relative or friend a thought-provoking question of your choice from their vast pool of possible options. Each unique prompt asks questions you've never thought to ask, like, what's the bravest thing you've ever done in your life? Or if you could see into the future, what would you want to find out? And it's pretty cool because I sent this to my grandmother a little while back, and they have those questions, and they have questions like, what were your grandparents like growing up? Or uh, what was your first boss like and you know that's questions like the what were her grandparents like that would be my great great grandparents that i never got to meet so those are very interesting things to learn that i've heard stories here and there but you know to get her to give you a detailed version of that is pretty cool and she got one the other day that was what was your first boss like and she so hilarious she's an old texas grandma and she goes now and i adam I, I i i don't know if i want to answer this i don't like speaking ill of people and i don't want to i i don't want to talk bad about him on this thing where it's going to be saved and i said just say what you feel like saying you can keep it short and sweet if you want to but you don't have to talk bad about the man <laughs> she was just so worried about something written down or she's talking trash about her first boss i'm like you know what that's okay because we all talk trash about our boss occasionally that's right that's right and if you don't talk trash about your boss you're either a liar or self-employed 
That's all I can yeah. say. So eh, the re- the reason she was so worried about it is because um, it, it's not just an immediate re- um, answer to the question. Because after one year, StoryWorth will compile all of your loved one's stories, including photos, into a beautiful keepsake book that you'll be able to share and revisit for generations to come. So after the year of her subscription, all her answers will get bundled up in a book and then we'll get the book and we get to keep it. So long after she's gone, we've got her answers in her words to these questions. And I think it's great because kind of helps you as you read through them and helps you connect with those people, um, no matter how near or far apart they are. And, you know, you don't have to give it to your grandma like I did. You give it to your dad your mom you can give it to your brother or sister just to kind of find out maybe stuff that y'all didn't talk about because you thought well i grew up together i don't need all this extra information but as we get older matt we realize these stories are going to go away and you may not remember every detail so this way it helps you remember all those little details and you know for my kids there is an 11 year difference between yeah. my oldest and my youngest. And I assure you, when those two talk, when they're adults, the, the stories they tell about mom and dad are going to be totally different. Oh, yeah. Because we were different. You know, I've always said first kid, you know, you sanitize everything, you clean everything else. Fifth kid, I just yeah I just brush it off on your pants. Yeah, just you know, blow the dirt fine. off of it. You'll be fine. That's right. Should should be fine. Should be yep. fine. <laughs> yep. So it 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 will be interesting. No matter who you send it to, you will get interesting answers, and I yeah. promise you, you're gonna enjoy this. What, so what an amazing keepsake. I know it really is. So with Story Worth, you know, we're giving those that we love a thoughtful personal gift from the heart and we're preserving their memories and stories for years to come like we said so if you want to do this and we recommend that you do because this is a great time to do it right here at the holidays and you don't have to go out and search the stores trying to find something to give people Um, all you've got to do is go to storyworth.com that's s-t-o-r-y W-O-R-T-H dot com slash grave G-R-A-V-E so storyworth dot com slash grave and you can save $10 on your first purchase. Yeah, so that's storyworth dot com slash grave and you can save $10 on your first purchase. It's an interesting theory. It's it's one I like. I think I could get behind it. And I had considered ley lines as well um, because there just doesn't seem to be any any other evidence that you could grab onto. And, and we don't have, you know, a lot of evidence on the, the ley line uh, theory either. Right. Um, but here's a question for me. Um, why, you know, why, why would that energy, you know, I can, it, you open up your mind a little bit. You can get behind the idea that, you know, there's dimensional portals and you may see, um, a higher volume of maybe hauntings or ghost sightings or things like that. Um, you know, m- maybe even the underground, you know, military bases, if they somehow were able to understand Uh there's, you know, there's a lot of energy right here. I mean, we we talked about how the native Americans may have been able to understand that this was an area of high energy. And that's why they put their, um, their sacred places along this, this area, but to, for what purpose, you know, we're, we're not, we're not seeing that. So, we take all those things that are essentially, you know, man-made, you know, we're going to build these sacred places. We're going to build these bases. We're going to report, 
you know, seeing ghosts or strange phenomena. But now we're, we're saying not only is it so powerful for that, it's powerful enough that it somehow attracts alien activity. Right. And, you know, when you, when you break down the numbers, I think, you know, there's been a lot of people that will say that will contradict Zakowski saying that there's, when you look at the numbers, it really doesn't add up that there's more here than anywhere else, Right. but there's, there's plenty of them to, to look into. And then you just stack that on top of all the other stuff. I, I, it, it becomes amplified then. Yeah. I don't think it's, you can say just because of one thing, like right. just because of the UFO sightings or just because of the, the, the legends from the ancient peoples about where the star people brought them down or, or whatever. But like you said, because you stack all of these things together, it, it creates like, um, it's, it's greater than it. The, the sum is greater than its parts mm -hmm. because of, of what we're talking about. Yeah. And one thing that I, I kind of noticed is that, you know, if you, if you expand it a little bit more beyond the 37th, which we've talked about, you know, the 35th, the 39th, mm -hmm. you, you begin to, to inch north, just north of the 40th parallel. And we're talking about the area in, um, in, in the Chicagoland area that we just discussed with flying humanoids. Right. So, I mean, it's, right. it's not exactly in that band, but it's very close. Close enough. You look at it globally. Yeah. And you, know, you, you start considering that, then you really begin to wonder what in the heck is mm -hmm. going on? Um, you know, the, the Michigan, the Lake Michigan triangle is right there. Yep. It's just, you know, if we took another hunk of the country, we could probably find a lot of paranormal activity in one area, whether it be UFO sightings or haunted locations or anything like that. We, we could dig them up from, you know, just taking one chunk of the country and saying, let's look sure. at this. Sure. But I don't think we would find the, the correlation to events in another chunk like we right. do here. You know, like we're talking about, you know, stretches all the way from Nevada, you know, up into, you know, Washington, D.C., yep. you know, Virginia, West Virginia, which, you know, West Virginia, you know, it's it's nuts up there. With that place with, is with a paranormal, paranormal hotspot. Yeah. So, you know, you, you I just don't think you can deny that there's something about the 37th parallel that makes things kind of weird yep exactly and and like you said you can't deny it but i don't think we can put a specific reason on it like even with ley lines we could we can say that there's more energy traveling along these lines and that's the theory but there's not a theory for the 37th parallel like that. The theory that I had, I just came up with based on our ley lines yeah. episode. Yeah. I, I, I haven't seen anybody say, well, here's why I think the, the 37th parallel is this way is because of blah, blah, blah. They, they haven't found anything yet. They just have gotten the data and put the data down and looked at it and said, okay, here's everything that's happening, but they haven't speculated on why. Yeah. And one thing we haven't touched on in regards to, to UFOs is the fact that we have so many reports of these sightings out over the Pacific ocean and the reports where it actually appeared that a craft was going you know, down into the water into, yeah. Making you kind of believe, well, maybe the aliens, you know, quote unquote aliens aren't coming from outer space. They're actually yeah. coming up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, USOs. 
But you you look and you follow the 37th parallel out into the Pacific Ocean, and that's where you see a lot of these reports is in that area out in the ocean. And we don't have right. a ton of reports like we do in the U.S. from other countries that this line goes through. But as Adam mentioned, you do have some, um, you know, very unique events that have been reported that do fall along the line. Maybe it's a situation where, you know, people aren't looking as close. Or it's not as densely populated. Not that, you know, right there through the Midwest, you know, there it runs through some pretty sparsely populated regions, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, it, it definitely goes through some areas that's got plenty of people to witness and report these things. Sure. It's just, it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy. I, I mean, I, I, in researching this, I've gone from, man, this is a stretch. You know, they're, they're really, you know, grasping at straws here to try to make this correlation for whatever reason to, Dang, I'm, I, th I think there might actually be something going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's directly, uh, you know, associated with, you know, the 37th parallel. Yeah. I, I, I think there's something going on. Um, I don't have a very good explanation for why, but I, I do believe there is something. And, you know, if you all have heard of anything that we haven't covered, associated with the 37th parallel let us know and i'm really interested to know what you guys think might be going on yeah so let us know and one of the best places to do that is in our facebook group we we mention it at the end of every show a lot of great people in there sharing a lot mm -hmm. of unique stories um some some jokes you know personal experiences any of it we love it and uh, it's a safe place to come and, and share those stories. And yes, it is. You're not going to be made fun of. You know, we're not going to be called a loony or anything like that. Um, everybody is just interested in, in hearing those those stories. And the um, only people that get called loonies in there are me and Matt. That's so right. That's it's, right. it's a good place. It's limited yep. to us, so you don't have to worry. But you can also check out our website which is graveyardpodcast.com. And on our website, you can listen to the show. Uh, you can find links to purchase Graveyard Tales merchandise. Uh, and you can become a patron. And we always take a moment to thank everyone that has donated to the show. It really makes a difference in how we're able to produce uh, a quality show for our listeners. And yep. we thank you so much for that. Uh, as Adam mentioned at the beginning, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes if you haven't already. And uh, I think that's it, man. Yeah. All right. Until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon.